have uh, back to back um, presentations today. Not, not much of a break in between. So uh, we'd like to move right along now. I'd like to introduce uh, Henry Kautz to you, uh, talking about smart and connected communities funded by the National Science Foundation. And I'll let Henry further introduce himself and, and get right into it. OK, thank you very much. So I'm the Division Director for Information and Intelligence Systems within the Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering. I'll talk about one of our most important cr cross directorate programs that supports the kind of work um, that goes on uh, here in this scenic community. So about half of the budget for computer science and engineering goes into what we call convergent research. So this is work that does not fit neatly within just the tradition of computer science itself, things like compilers or networks. But involves multiple disciplines focusing on important national needs. And these range from cybersecurity to understanding the brain, but the one I'm going to focus on today deals with smart communities. So what do we even mean by foundational research in smart communities? It is where we go, uh, we, we strive to understand the dynamic interplay between technology and society, right? So part of it is developing advanced technology, but just as important is understanding the impact of that on society in some particular application area, and then how that drives the technology itself. And of course, as you all know, communities are rapidly changing today. Communities, uh, and, and one part of it is the uh, commercial deployment of all kinds of smart technology, right? Uh, and it's happening partly with government support, but also largely through the private sector, things like the Nest you know, thermometer. Um, we also are seeing uh, great shifts in demographics. Right, that as uh, whole communities uh, uh, are, are, are rising with, um, uh, uh, you know, I said, moving from, uh, uh, you know, certain parts of the countries to, to others, uh, immigration and so on. So we can think of uh, foundational research in smart communities as work that's at that intersection. So we have the core technology on the inside we have on the outside various domains, water management, um, emergency management services, agriculture, and so on. And then that intersection with the community. And by community, we mean both, uh, you know, we mean people, we mean industry, we mean uh, government. So I'd like to drill down now upon the uh, particular awards we, we made in 2018. So in 2018, this was about a $20 million program. We had 11 awards. The biggest single area was water management, but we also supported work in energy, mobility and transportation, urban planning, hazards and disasters, and education. So let's further drill down into a few of the particular projects. So stormwater, as we know, particularly in California over the last year, is a very important uh, issue for communities. It seems you either have not enough water or way too much. So this project was uh, in, brought together researchers from a number of uh, top universities, University of Michigan, University of Tennessee, University of Virginia, together with cities across those home states, um, as well as nonprofit organizations like EMNet. On the technical side of the work, uh, researchers studied how to deploy various kinds of sensors. Some of these sensors were in um, uh, rain, soil, and moisture sensors. These would be uh, in our uh, green infrastructure, in our gray infrastructure. Some would be buried deep 
uh, below the ground to understand uh, the uh, water at various uh, depths in the soil in different parts of a city. There also were the holding ponds where stormwater would be diverted. So we're going to carefully monitor the, those, but then we're also going to add new kinds of uh, uh, smart valves so we can dynamically and in real time move the water around in ways that was not possible uh, just a few years ago. So that's on we might call the uh, the site level work and that's going to involve researchers in hydrology um, and uh, stormwater engineering. Then to make all of the um, interactions between these various sensors and create predictive models and then drive those smart valves. That brings us into a work with researchers in computer science and control theory. So that's the, the, the blue uh, uh, box in, in the middle of the slide. But then uh, further, we need to understand the social side. So that's the uh, uh, this uh, sort of a pink box in the, the uh, upper right. Because these things are not deployed in a vacuum. You, you've got the city engineers. You've got uh, the, the community homeowners who are worried about their property. You've got the land developers. Um, uh, you have to really build uh, trust and gain access to the knowledge of, of each of these uh, people. So there were researchers in uh, urban planning and the social sciences. And finally, in addition to simply doing the, the planning and the kind of purely academic research, you go out and you build prototypes. So these systems were prototyped in four cities. Now let's drill down even further to one of those uh, locations in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And one of the particular uh, results that came out of this, this is in this issue of the smart um, storage ponds. And what they discovered is that simply by adding the sensors and even a single uh, valve that was dynamically controlled um, using a resource optimization algorithm, you could almost double the capacity uh, in times of, of, of storms for that pond. So um, uh, they can then show, go back and so, okay, uh, to the city planners, this isn't just you know pure academic theory. We can actually save you money and help you protect your city. More generally, there, there are many issues where there is some uh, technology that could um, uh, have an impact on a community's uh, um, uh, health and safety, but there are many different stakeholders. Now this uh, particular example also begins with handling stormwater, but could be applied to, to many other uh, kinds of issues, uh, energy use, uh, uh, wildlife conservation, and so on. So here, here's, here's the concept. Um, you have a bunch of stakeholders, and the stakeholders, they all want to get to a positive outcome, but they each are looking at the issue from a different perspective. And if everybody just stays in their own bubble and only is understanding their own goal, right? They're never going to come to an agreement. You're going to always uh, be fighting, even though you all want the public good. So what uh, this project looked at, can we use what are called serious games uh, to help a team of stakeholders understand the bigger picture and come to consensus about uh, the options, the best options for handling uh, a situation. So, uh, and here the, the, the researchers um, uh, created a, a online uh, game that would essentially, uh, a simulation game for stormwater 
management based upon uh, a the particular um, a, you know a particular city, uh, and had the the different uh, people people from the uh, homeowners association people from you know the the local government uh, uh, play this together so they could uh, look at the different options and see okay this you know this particular choice maybe that's what I thought was going to be best because it seemed to me based on my own local view that was best for protecting uh, my own let's say my own neighborhood but really would have uh, a suboptimal effect for the larger community here's uh, you could explore the different options and, and come up with uh, better solutions uh, Turning from water uh, to energy, uh, a project out of Purdue University uh, looked at making uh, uh, residential communities uh, more energy aware and energy efficient. So here, uh, the researchers uh, partnered with four Indiana cities with their subsidized housing to say, could we um, both uh, deploy technology that would monitor energy use and then make recommendations to the community about reducing their energy footprint and leverage the, the, the sense of community. So uh, users could go into a community center and see how is our building doing, okay? So going beyond just know each individual user but bringing people together sort of creating this sort of sense of of a team we're working together to reduce our overall energy footprint and then we each are going to benefit by uh, having lower energy um, bills so this approach uh, this system uh, or this project was looking at this from uh, the the acts the aspect of the community around a particular um, physical set of locations. Another project from University uh, 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 Oregon State University instead said, well, instead of starting with a, a particular you know, set of buildings, let's start with some uh, a, a social group that is uh, children, in particular, involved in the Girl Scouts. Okay. So this, in this uh, city of Fremont, California, they have the data on the energy use from each household based on smart meters, and they can estimate, you know, with the energy spikes, are you using air conditioning, uh, you know, is, is this uh, heating, you know, what is the particular use, and developed um, applications that uh, could allow a, a particular homeowner to see um, their energy use and, and to think about optimizing it. And then they went out and uh, had uh, uh, workshops with the Girl Scouts so that the girls would go home to their families and essentially teach their families about energy um, conservation. And one final example I'd like to turn to is in a uh, uh, risk management and this is uh, was a, uh, a project on landslide uh, risk management um, and the disciplines that brought together were geoscience uh, data science so computer science and statistics and uh, social science so again something that you've seen in California are problems with uh, landslides and sometimes landslides are unexpected, but more often landslides are kind of a slow moving disaster that as you have a rain coming, as you have areas where there's not been good soil conservation, the risk of a landslide is growing day by day by day. And you can start to say, you know, that, you know, the chance is getting higher and higher, 50% chance, 75% chance we're going to have uh, a landslide in a particular uh, community and people are going to get hurt. So on the technical side, the technological side, again, the, the researchers looked at various kinds of sensors 
that could be used to improve the reliability of landslide forecasting. Uh, but just as important, how do you encourage people to act upon that information? Now, when the wildfire is raging, right, it's, uh, you can usually get people to evacuate, right? Although we even saw that that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes, you know, the, the fire is just uh, a few meters away and, and people are still sitting uh, in their homes. So what do you do when it's this kind of slow moving disaster and you know it's coming, it's getting more and more likely, but, you know, people aren't seeing it immediately. They're seeing maybe some mud, you know, moving around, but, you know, any minute now, suddenly it's going to let go and, and a bunch of homes are going to be crushed. Uh, so on the social science side, they, they looked at the effect of community influencers. So this is a subject that's been long studied in social science of social networks, and there can be sort of key people in the community whose influence is outsized, okay? So can you uh, basically work with the particular, a particular subset of community influencers, you know, really bring them into the process, uh, educate them, have them understand the technology, and then they're the ones who can talk to their neighbors and say, look, okay, it's time now to pack up, get, get the kids in the station wagon, and um, let's go. And it's interesting that uh, when you think of, of uh, this kind of influencer network, uh, this is a uh, sort of an area of social science that's been broadly applied in advertising and in you know, uh, selling products, and it's great to see this technology now being used, uh, or this, this kind of a social science being used in a, uh, a situation for social good. Okay, so I hope that gave you a sense of the kind of work that is funded through this program. You need to have, but it's not just, a, a, not just an application, you do need to have some, some core advance in technology you need to have community uh, stakeholders and a plan for bringing people together, uh, prototyping, uh, you know, test deployments and evaluations. And hopefully in the successful cases that could be followed up, uh, uh, you know, by work that would actually turn this into, you know, wide scale deployment uh, funded by, um, uh, you know, other uh, parts of the government. The uh, program requires letters of intent, and that's coming up in August, and then full proposals in September, so you're in good shape to, to think about what you might want to do. Um, for the, the full, um, actually, uh, you know, building this, we call this an integrative research grant. Um, we have tracks for, for midsize and, and large, but we also have planning grants. So this is a, a great way to get start, uh, started, probably you know, really be really the recommended way, is to first get a planning grant for $150,000 and do a series of workshops, uh, uh, you know, convene with your, your different uh, stakeholders. And uh, one thing we've noticed is, uh, I always have to add this, is pay attention uh, to the details because uh, of the solicitations, because we, Hate to return anything without review because of, of some little non-compliant issue. There are other opportunities, though, for community-based uh, research. Um, uh, two I particularly like. One is research experiences uh, for undergraduates. Essentially, any researcher can get a supplement to support undergraduates. And a, a great thing to do with undergraduates, right, is to do some kind of community outreach project as well as CITES awards for cohorts of 10 students over a summer. And then I'd also, for those of you in the university, I'd like to particularly point out our program on National Science Foundation Research Traineeships. So this supports master's and PhD level um, education in high priority interdisciplinary or convergent research areas. Um, and it particularly is, is saying, let's prepare students 
not just for academic careers, but let's say careers in the private sector, non-governmental organization, uh, and government agencies. Uh, so uh, the, when I've seen successful awards, they typically uh, might be a couple of different departments, such as maybe computer science and hydrology, right? And they say, you know, here's, uh, we're going to do something novel here. We're going to try to uh, broaden our PhD program so that students are not in a single box, but we can have some cross-training between disciplines. Uh, this is, uh, I said, this program provides um, uh, about uh, three and a half million dollars uh, a year um, over, over three years. And uh, once you get these awards, uh, you essentially are, are getting the award for the training as opposed to just cranking out research papers. So they really give you a lot of flexibility uh, in that training process to uh, develop new, um, uh, new research. Um, and uh, another mechanism that's, that's wonderful for getting projects started is early concept grants for exploratory research or EAGERS, up to $300,000 a year over two years. And again, uh, these are particularly aimed at novel work and uh, convergent research is much appreciated. So you have some crazy idea. Uh, find the NSF program that seems closest to your crazy idea. Look for a program director who helps manage that program and simply start a conversation with them. You know, and, and literally, you, you know, typically you start by, you know, making an appointment, uh, have a phone call, or send a, a one-pager um, and discuss that. And if that program director said, you know, I, I, I'd be interested in seeing the details of this, you write a very short uh, proposal, about five pages long, plus, you know, budgets and things. And uh, then those can be uh, funded, uh, uh, you know, quickly with, without review. Again, a, an excellent way to get that initial research done uh, so that you can then go out and look for a multi-million dollar um, opportunity. And thank you, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Here comes. People that might actually initiate a research study would be at the university. Yes. Uh, is there a way, uh, a place, or a forum for us to express our interest and say, hey, what universities out there are looking to do research in XYZ, and we're located here in Southern California, uh, we'd love to partner with you? Uh, yes, yeah, so the question is, yeah, do we have such a forum? We don't currently um, have such a forum. That probably would be a, uh, a great thing uh, uh, to do. Um, what, what I have found, though, is, at least in, in my own work, that, um, uh, you know, when, when I have been, you know, contacted by, let's say, a, a, you know, a, a, a school district, if it, if it relates to, to my own interests, um, I can be receptive. So, so uh, I, I'll, I'll, have, I'll actually, you know, bring up that idea. Can we do more to help convene um, the non-universities, because at the end of the day, the, 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 the awards are coming from, you know, largely from uh, universities and nonprofits. I, I'm just going to comment that Scenic is the place to have this conversation. The DC HPR tax are meeting this afternoon, asking Scenic to create a forum to say, hey, I'm a K through 12 in this area what university is doing this particular research that I'm interested in, or for the campuses to say, we're putting together a proposal, are there any K through 12s or community colleges interested in participating? So I, I would recommend that we do something kind of locally while we're waiting for NSF to put together maybe a match to something outside the state. So that's just my comment. My recommendation would be to contact the local computer science department in your local university. 
the provost's office. When I was at University of Washington, I ran a community partnerships group in the provost's office. People contacted me all the time saying, who at your university is doing research in this area? And I referred people to landscape architecture, pediatric dentistry, computer science, the whole litany of disciplines. So if your university has a computer community partnerships office, go there. If they don't, go to the different departments where you might have an interest. Hi, thank you. You mentioned convergent research a couple of times, and I know there are some new programs in that area. Could you unpack that a little bit and, and tell us more about what, what's going on with NSF there? Right. Uh, so convergent research is simply what NSF calls interdisciplinary research. Uh, and uh, as I said, it, it's grown over the last decade from about 20% of the budget to about 50% of the budget. So these would be programs that have more than one discipline uh, helping manage them. Uh, uh, if you look at the NSF website, you'll also see we, uh, what NSF calls its, its current set of 10 big ideas. Uh, those are all convergent ideas that, that uh, meet national priorities. So for example, one of the, this year there's uh, 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 two big new convergent programs. Actually, then these both might be of interest to people here at Scenic. One is called the Future of Work at the Human Technology Frontier, and the other is called Harnessing the Data Revolution. Okay. Okay, if no more questions, thank you very much.